Welcome to episode five of the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. And before I introduce my guest, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody who has supported the channel thus far. Uh, let me know what you think of the show in the comments. I'd love to get back to you. You can also subscribe to the channel for future content uh, and make sure to hit the little bell icon for notifications of videos in the future. So one more thing before we get into our guest, the audio quality was a little weird. I did my best to cut it together so that it's not as apparent. So if you notice that, I do apologize. But I'm really excited to introduce our guest for today because he is one of the smartest guys I have ever met uh, and one of my biggest mentors. So he is a professor of applied science at the College of William & Mary, and he seeks to understand the neural origins of rhythmic behavior. And so his research is currently studying respiration and locomotor function. He has publications in the Journal of Neuroscience, the Journal of Neurophysiology, and plenty more. And he has one of the most amazing reviews on the respiratory literature to date. Uh, And he's just one of the nicest guys I've ever met. He really cares about his students, and uh, I'm really excited to introduce you to him. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Christopher Del Negro. Christopher Del Negro, how are you? I'm doing well, Andrew. Thanks for asking. Um, how are you? I'm doing really well. Uh, I'm here in Williamsburg right now. I'm sheltering from the heat because it's been pretty oppressive, but um, I'm having a really good time. Excellent. And you're in Nashville. I am. It's not very hot here. It's actually quite comfortable. And, well, that's nice to hear. And you are, you're there for your son who is recording an album right now. That's right. He's 16, and uh, he's in a music studio with his band, recording as much of the, as much as they can of their first record. And because he's a minor, and this is the music business, my wife and he and I are, are here to to monitor. To monitor. Very good. Is the whole band staying in in your hotel? None of the band is staying in our hotel. Actually, the band is living in the music studio. When you rent out a music studio. Um, you have it 24-7, and so it behooves you to use it all day and all night. So the band simply plays music until they fall down dead tired, and then they wake up the next morning and get right up and start playing again. We, we delivered them dinner last night, and they all look incredibly uh, tired, and not a single kid or band member has left the house in three days. <laughs> <laughs> the studio uh, is in, it's it's in an to... old it's an old renovated home, so it's like a, it's, it's it's an old oh, okay. stately uh, Nashville manor that's been renovated into a music studio. It's probably tough being a big time musician, especially when you're that young. Well, they're not big time yet, but that's what they're aiming for. I like it. I like it a lot. Well, awesome. Okay, well, great. I'm curious. So you study neuroscience. I mean, you're, you're a professor of applied science at the College of William & Mary. Um, and you study mainly respiratory neurobiology, from what I gleam, anyway. So what are, you, what are you working on right now? I'm just curious. We have two foci right now. So about 10 years ago, my group in parallel with a, a group in France discovered the cellular point of origin for breathing, a, 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 um, a class of neurons in, in the brainstem derived from a certain gene, a transcription factor gene called developing brain homeobox 1, DBX1. And after that discovery about a decade ago, we knew the cells, these are the cells that generate the breathing rhythm. So, well, what next? You need to go a little bit deeper. So, how do these neurons, now we know which neurons are doing it, how do they do it? So then we started studying the mechanisms by which they interact with one another and the ion channels in, inter, into their membranes that allow them to be rhythmically active together. So for the past decade, I've now started focusing more on the ion channel level mechanisms by which these neurons generate breathing rhythm. So I have a major project in that direction and we're looking at three classes of ion channels, sodium ion channels, potassium ion channels, and then a class called TRIPS, transient receptor potential channels. And we've completed the TRIP phase of the study, and we're about three quarters of the way done with the sodium channel part, and we're about to begin to study the potassium channels that are essential for generating breathing. The other major project in the lab is to look not just at breathing in and out, in and out, but to look at psi breaths. People don't recognize the importance of size oftentimes. They may associate size with emotion, but size are actually for lung health and periodic sighing is also a breathing behavior that we're trying to figure out the the origin of that and it turns out looks like our data suggests it's completely different from the way normal eupneic breathing is generated so that's it in a nutshell those two projects 
And what, what about breathing is so important that you are trying to get people to understand? I mean, at a basic level, people are comfortable with the idea that you have to breathe to live. The rhythm for breathing originates before, um, before any animal is born, whether the animal is hatching out of an egg or um, you know, emerging from its mom. Breathing has to be ready to go from day one. So if you have an animal that's born and the animal can't breathe within a few minutes, it's dead. But if you have an animal that's born and it can't suckle or it can't chew, that animal could live a few days uh, before it would starve to death. So almost any other behavior has time to develop after birth, except breathing. Breathing has to be ready to go, step one. So when I think about all the incredible things the brain can do, and we're human beings, so we think about things like learning and memory, you know, vocal performance, I don't know, playing musical instruments, performing exceptionally in a sport, those are really exciting behaviors. But the brain has to cover its bases by just making sure you stay breathing the whole time before any of those other behaviors are possible. You gotta cover your bases, you gotta make sure you're breathing. So I think when I'm a neuroscientist, it's what's the most elemental brain function there is, is keep this person alive, keep this mammal, keep this bird alive, breathe. So that's the fundamental so, importance. Yeah, and I mean, this is, I guess, the 1990s. What was like, I know neuros... Was it? I was trying to give you some credit. It was. It was actually the 19... It was actually the 1980s. Well, I'm curious but, uh, because neuroscience was, was yeah. such a growing field back then. And nobody no, no, really it's good. I started in the 80s and I mentioned. finished in the 90s. Um, how did you end up so specifically, like respiratory neurobiology and rhythmogenic behavior is a very specific field of neuroscience. How did you end up with that specifically from kinesiology? So I know you're into sports performance and, and sports yourself, so you probably have the same kind of interests I had as a, a young person in college. Um, I was really interested in sports, but I wasn't necessarily outfitted to be an elite performer myself. So I started to think, well, where, where could I really excel? And it was in the mental element of sport, you know, thinking about it intellectually, doing research. Um, I'll always be physically active and stay in shape, but I wasn't an elite athlete. So I gravitated towards studying sport performance, and that's why I went to kinesiology. But really, even after my first semester of studying kinesiology, I didn't come to the but even after my first semester, I said to myself, the real mysteries here are here. <laughs> you know, not here. <laughs> the mysteries are here in the brain. And um, my, my visual performance doesn't help in a podcast, so I apologize to your audience right now. What I did was I'm pointing to my head, and I'm saying the mysteries are really in, in how the brain makes the body perform not in the muscles and bones that make movements happen or elite movements happen, but it's how the brain can produce them. So I started moving my focus up towards the brain. And as I finished my undergraduate major and began to think about graduate schools, I thought, okay, am I gonna study motor control in general, motor neurons, limb movements? I started to get more and more interested in breathing because of its physiological significance and because the system is so robust, it's more amenable to laboratory investigations. So I thought I could probably discover more things if I studied a system that was more amenable to being studied rather than something that was difficult to study in the lab. Interesting. Whenever you're working out, do you ever think to yourself, oh, this is like, this is what's going on in my head right now? Yes, I do all the time. Um, particularly like, for example, if I'm swimming really hard and when you swim really hard, you, your, your breathing is limited by how often you push your head out of the water. That's not the case in running, but it is the case in swimming and I start to feel air hunger, something we studied uh, together recently, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing as hard as I can physically, but I can't breathe anymore, then, then I can pull my head out of the water, and um, I, do, I do start to feel the air hunger, and I say, okay, I know what this is doing yeah. in my brain, I know what, what I'm experiencing, I'm not really in danger, but it feels like I'm in danger. Uh, so, in fact, when I do exercise, I do think about neuroscience. Yeah, so I always wonder that myself, when I work out, I, I now, especially after reading this book, I now think about breathing to myself and how fundamental it is to sort of the physiological health or the state in which I'm in, um, which was interesting. The air hunger concept was really interesting to me um, about this book because it was saying how uh, increased levels of carbon dioxide in the body are actually good for you. They increase oxygen absorption. Is that correct? Yes, that makes sense. But I think the thing that James Nestor, the author of the, the book that you're, you're speaking about, doesn't distinguish 
is the levels of carbon dioxide in arterial blood versus venous return blood. And he doesn't make a distinction between the two, but there really is a big difference. So the amount of carbon dioxide that you have in your arterial blood is always going to be low. It's never going to be high. So when he talks about we should be elevating our carbon dioxide in the blood, he, he simply, it just, it's, it's a little bit simplistic because you, you can't do it to your arterial blood because it's, the arterial blood is refreshed, as you know, after going through the alveoli and the capillaries of the, the alveoli. So it's going to come out of the alveoli with an extraordinarily low level of carbon dioxide, and, and you can't change that. So it's only the level of carbon dioxide that comes back through the, the venous return that can be potentially elevated a little bit more. Does that make sense? Do you think there's like a... Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, well, I'll, to be fair, a lot of these things don't really make sense to me at first glance, but when I look, when I look a little closer, it, it does make sense eventually. Um, especially your... Um, Another thing I want to talk about, I mean, I read your, I had to read your 2018 review because that's what my senior seminar paper was basically about. Um, but your 2018 review on the, you know, the current research for respiratory, like respiration was amazing. I thought it was so interesting. Um, and you said you're working on something similar. Yeah. Right so now. every, yeah, every four years or so, the, the co-author on that last paper was Feldman. Feldman's the, um, I mean, he's the, the most important researcher in this field that, that, that there ever has been, and I was fortunate to train under him, and he and I tend to write a, a review paper together every three or four years, so we're working on one now. It's not ready for prime time yet, which is why I didn't send it to you. We actually, I was actually working on it prior to our talk now, and I'll work on it again tomorrow, and I'll, I'll meet with my co-authors to talk about it. But, but anyway, I want to get back to the 18 one. Uh, the, the 2018 yeah. paper took us more than two years to write. The idea for that paper began in a whiskey bar in Dublin in 2016, where we hashed out the figures on whiskey bar napkins with pens, and that was the birth of that paper. So it didn't come out until more than two years later, but that one was a real- Where all good ideas, yeah. All the best ideas begin in whiskey bars on napkins. I mean, um, that sounds like a joke, but um, more, than, more than a dozen of my best works have started that way. It's true. I love it. Well, the, I guess the, I remember reading the origin story uh, for the name of the pre Boston complex. Uh, very, that's pretty funny. I guess you're right. <laughs> it all comes back to alcohol. Um, it, it comes down to the fact that when scientists go to meetings and they have a very formal part of the meeting where they're doing their presentations, they're talking, it's early in the day, it's very formal. And then they tend to, after the sessions are over, go out, have dinner, get a beer. And then they begin to loosen up a little bit and talk about what they're really thinking about. And, and that freedom lets you be more, more intellectually creative. And sometimes your best ideas start to emerge after you let down your guard a little bit. So that can happen, you know, just because you're socially together. Um, I've also been to a couple meetings where we would have scientific conference for half the day and then go skiing in the afternoon. And you get a bunch of scientists out and they're riding chairlifts together and skiing. That also tends to make people happy and loosen up and, and, and start to talk about what they're, what, what they're really doing or what's really on their minds. What were you doing in Dublin? Were you at a conference? <laughs> could be a, could be a far side comic. We were at the annual meeting of the Physiological Society of London. Uh, I had organized a session on, um, on chemo sensation and so I was there with a bunch of breeders. Well, like actually, me so and, coming back to this and, book, and I was decided curious. to write this review um, paper at a whiskey it, bar. I mentioned that public. lung capacity was the strongest correlate to longevity, and I just I just don't know how true that is. And I wanted to ask you more formally what your, your opinions of that are. Yeah, I read that statistic too, and it doesn't make sense physiologically to me, but I'm not going to question the statistic, but it could be a correlation, not causation thing. There, in other words, there could be some other factor there. Um, I mean, I've also heard statistics like, um, you know, Japanese people that, that eat certain kinds of diets tend to be the most long-lived people. Okay, maybe that's their diet, maybe it's something else, or you know, I, I don't know. I've, I hear statistics like that from time to time, and I tend not to take too much in are you it. ever outside um, the film field? So of I don't know much about lung capacity being else? a book, uh, you study longevity, uh, uh, for instance. Predictor of longevity. Yeah. 
No, I, but I do have another branch of research, which is uh, how the brain initiates locomotion. So breathing is all the time. You don't, you don't start, stop. I mean, except for small pauses, like for underwater dives and stuff like that. But locomotion is episodic. And one chooses to execute motor programs, and then if you execute one motor program, don't execute another one. So there involves initiation and, 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 and filtering. And I'm studying how the midbrain initiates and, 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 and refines lo locomotion now. And that's a branch of research I started a couple of years ago when I was uh, working in Denmark on my last sabbatical. And the applications of that are to things like Parkinson's. So if you think about what Parkinson's dyskinesias are, patients who suffer from Parkinson's either cannot initiate the movements they wish or they can't stop movements they should otherwise suppress so you have shaking behaviors. Patients probably don't want to shake, but they can't stop. But then also their walking is inhibited. They can't initiate. Yeah, the so there's I problems in the initiation and the filtering of movements. That and that's, that's one of the things so I've, I've recently was taken up. How you can see um, brain activity before a motor program is even executed. So you kind of, it, that's just so fascinating to me. And I don't know if that happens consciously or unconsciously. Because for instance, before you execute a movement in a lift, for instance, or you're doing some uh, martial arts, you're vi you know, I tend to visualize what's going to happen. Um, and I, I, obviously that's a conscious process. I, I don't know if there's a differentiation between like unconscious planning for motor execution or or conscious planning it's different to me it's not not that interesting because I think about movements or motor programs that I perform all the time I put very little intellectual investment in performing them because they're just automatic for me so whether it's conscious or unconscious I think about it as when I drive a car, yes, I can consciously think about it, but it's, I've been doing it so long, I, it doesn't require much investment. But I'm aware of it. On the other hand, like if I try and do some of the things on a guitar that my son does, for me it requires incredible concentration. I have to block everything out just to put the fingers in the right place. Whereas he can do it and have a conversation because it's automatic. So for me, there's like this gray area yeah. of how much investment in conscious control and how much is automatic, and there's a continuum you rather than a, a switch. But that's an opinion. That's not like, it's not in textbooks. That's my opinion. Really? I'm trying to write a book. I'm trying to take the class. Well, I don't know if you want somebody to read it before him, but I'm trying to I know I don't like people books, reading so my that's stuff. That's one of my goals. I'm done with I'm four this. chapters in. Yeah. Very good. Very good. That's exciting. So I'm curious also, I mean, knowing so much about the field, obviously. You'll be first on my list. Um, do you take any steps to strengthen your breathing? Because we talked in this book, it talks a lot about breathing exercises and things that are really important for lung function. Do you do anything specifically that helps you? or? I think so. For instance, um, the book makes a lot of case for modulating and controlling your breathing in a disciplined way, um, and, and I definitely do that. And it is to calm myself, to activate my parasympathetic nervous system for the calming emotional effect of breathing discipline. The, the book that you're talking about talks about using your breathing to amp yourself up or calm yourself down. Lots of you know you can go mm -hmm. different directions. I don't want the I don't want the amp up type. I have enough stress in my life. I have enough things going on. What I need is to calm down more often than, calm, than, than ramp up. So I do disciplined breathing with um, in for four or five, hold for one, out for four or five, in, in a seated position, in an alert state of mind, and that helps me focus. I do that a lot. I also find that um, what the book says about controlling your breathing to the point where you get a little hypercapnic, where you elevate your carbon dioxide levels, so I find that in my own swimming workouts, by forcing myself to work out really hard and and in a limited breathing condition, it, it I'm not sure I have the right words for it, but it, it really changes my 
brain state for many hours afterwards. It's not just the endorphins of working out, but there's something about the breathing discipline there that I, I mm. think it really works. And um, I know my, my son suffers from stress a little bit. He's 16, he's a young man. He's just lived through a pandemic. Mm. And so I've been, been I, encouraging I him be to tough. take advantage I mean, of those breathing disciplines. in high school, I, uh, and I imagine. I, I, I don't know how and much he is, but I think he is a little bit. you're also at a university. You're kind of just always in academia, especially through the pandemic. I can't even imagine. Yeah, it was, it was a difficult year, but I don't think it was any harder for me than anybody else. I think probably a lot of other jobs were, were a lot harder. People who own restaurants, hair salons, bars, um, anything in the, the tourism industry were hard hit. I literally Whereas, have never seen Even you though person. it was more difficult, I was able to teach online. I mean, I feel like I know you, but yet I don't think we've ever seen each other in person. I um, literally have never seen you in yeah, and, and yet somehow we did two classes together and you know, I feel like I have as much of a relationship with you as I've had with any other student over the past 18 years. So I feel like it worked okay and it wasn't that difficult. As far as my son's experience this year, it was what is he interested definitely in, harder for him aside from the music? Is this kind of what but he's shooting for to, right now? I was able to help him with a few things here and there. Mm. Yeah. Arts and arts and humanities. He's a literature, music, art kind of kind of guy. Yeah. yeah. I like that. That's cool. I used uh, I studied English education before neuroscience. Cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think people tend to think about, you know, uh, sciences and humanities as being diametrically opposed, and they're not. They're quite complementary, in my view. Mm. Well, I was just curious because, I mean, I've lived through one side of the pandemic as a student, and you've lived through it as through another as a as a professor. Um, and I don't know if you you could probably testify to the uh, the difficulty that people have probably. People, have, students have probably been coming to you saying, oh, this is really tough. This is really tough. They have, yeah, for so. sure. Yeah, how have you handled, like, the, I, I know that there is a lot of surveys that indicate that, you know, stress levels have been through the roof, especially as of this past year. Have you, how have you handled that? For, for myself or for my students? Well, for your students. So, I mostly have PhD students, as you know, like my, my, my first orbit around me is my PhD students and I have five of them and most of them had difficult years but the labs were never closed down so most all my students were able to conduct their research in person in the laboratory with distancing and masks and so on so for me my immediate circumstance wasn't that difficult and my graduate students didn't have a lot of additional stress because of the the technical problems of getting supplies and stuff over the year past year one of my PhD students had to postpone her graduation by two weeks uh, by six months and mm. so that that was a bit of a hiccup for her and she and her husband had to plan for that but other than that it wasn't that bad the hardest thing was really for undergraduates like you you know you're graduated now but but being an undergraduate I think was was far 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 more difficult yeah one thing I will say and I'm glad I could put this on the record. I really enjoyed how you referred to us as colleagues. It made me feel really special. That's how I feel. Uh, it really bugs me when people at William & Mary refer to you as kids. You're not kids. Very far from kids. I don't even refer to my son as... I sometimes refer to him as a kid. Okay, 16. But I think you, you're you young adults, and that's that's how you refer to... It. It's also the Danish way, the, the California way. People in Denmark tend to see one another as equals at all levels of society. Like if you met the prime minister of Denmark, you'd mm. call her by her first name. <laughs> really? Yeah, absolutely. Is that how they do it? Yes. Yep. That's why. Do you know why? They. It's an egalitarian society, and 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 it's it's just a it's a part of their culture. That all right? I'm not an expert on Denmark. I just happen to like that I lived there, <laughs> so I gleaned a few things along the way. And they tend to view everyone's on the same level. You know, you're no better than the prime minister. The prime minister is no better than you. Mm. That's so interesting. The only other place that I've been to outside of the U.S. is the Dominican Republic to play baseball. Ah, cool. Yeah, back when I was 16, or I guess 17. So, But, yeah, I remember being 17, 
I guess 16, and having no direction of what I wanted to do, um, knowing that I just wanted to try everything that people said I couldn't do. So you must have been a pretty good student to have ended up at William & Mary. I wasn't. I really was not. Um, well, I don't know. People called me a closet nerd because they thought that uh, on the exterior I was this big sports guy, but I secretly studied and I loved my academics, which I guess is sort of I mean, true, you're not the first person to be think... like that, right? I, my first PhD student, uh, Ryland Pace, uh, who joined my lab in 2004, was like that. He came to William Mary, excellent athlete, but was also profoundly good at his studies. And um, the older he got, the more <laughs> passionate he got about his studies. He ended up doing a PhD with me uh, just out of passion and then after he finished his PhD, he was like, all right, now it's time to get really serious, and he became a doctor. Now he's an ER doc. <laughs> he did a PhD a, for the that's love of I, it. <laughs> I've, that's pretty good, actually. I've, uh, I'm actually a surgical assistant. I just got a position in Fairfax. Hey, man, that's great. Congratulations. Yeah. I know you were talking about you were trying to corral the, uh, the students of our class to uh, pursue PhD programs, and you asked, well, who, oh, who's looking to do a PhD? A PhD program, and I think like one person raised their hand. It's okay. I, I think. I I mean, it makes sense. You know, if everyone goes and gets a PhD, there's not going to be enough jobs for basic researchers out there. Uh, whereas, if you go into medicine, there's always a job. There's lots of needs for clinical medicine. So, I don't feel like everybody needs to get a PhD. Certainly not. It, it's for the. It's for those who, simply, are so passionate about. Um, the research that that's where they want to go. Mm. Yeah, for me, it was sort of a decision. Did I want to work with, you know, a tight knit group of people and sort of myself? Or did I want to be exposed to people and people of all sorts of origins and things like that? And I'm a very social person. I think I, I think I really would find the research to be super interesting. But I would probably long for more of a intimate relationship with other people. Well, it's good you so, know yourself like that. I will say this about PhD the, or the academic route. Although I don't deal with nearly as many people as, say, my, my former student who's an ER doc does. He deals with lots and lots of people. What I get is four or five years of quite intimate mentorship with my PhD students. So that, for instance, that student I'm talking about now, he graduated in 2007. It's well after a decade, but he sends me email all the time. We talk on the phone every couple months. Um, I know all his kids' names and their birthdays and, you know, so it, 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 when a PhD student and mentor really unite in the way they should, it becomes a lifelong relationship and uh, that's, that's really cool. And it's sometimes it's like that with under, it's sometimes like that with undergraduate students that work for a long time in the lab. I had one young woman who came to me as a high school intern. She lived in Williamsburg. And then she matriculated at William & Mary, and so when she came to William & Mary, she was already competent to work in my lab, so even as a freshman, she was doing research. Worked for me for four years, published two papers with me. Now she's in a, almost done with her PhD at Boston University, and I, I feel like she was a PhD student, <laughs> even though she was an undergraduate. So sometimes it goes like mm -hmm. that, too. I was a little afraid when you had the expectation for our senior seminar that you were going to treat us like PhD students. I was a little, I was like, uh, I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> you did fine, though. Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, I panicked a few times, but it was all good. It actually turned out to be one of my favorite classes. And you turned out to be one of my favorite teachers, which is really funny to me because, I mean, people have mentioned that you are, you teach difficult concepts. And so I think that can be a little intimidating. So when I tell them, Oh yeah, I'm taking cellular biophysics with Dr. Christopher Del Negro, and they're like, "Oh boy, well, good luck with that." You applied yourself. You did. You did really well. Oh, but God, this was that teaching biophysics and modeling was really difficult last year. I've taught the class. Well, I've taught the class in, in person, and but to make the videos and like learning how to do that technically, I, oh, it was it was tough. It was tough. I'm looking forward to being back in person in the fall. I, I was going to say because, yeah, there's no more mask mandate. And that sucks because, well, I guess you always have those lectures now. You know, they're all recorded. I'm going to redo every single one of them because, uh, 
you know, what I did in cell biophysics and modeling, I used the Penopto system, which I did. I, I mean, I didn't think it, it wasn't that great. But what I did for our class, respiratory neurobiology, was I think a bit better. I used, you know, you know what I did. Um, I think it was a bit a bit better. The structure of it, the pacing worked a lot better. So I, I plan to re-record all the, the cellular biophysics and modeling uh, lectures just 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 to keep mm. keep a like a reference for students to go back to if they want to see something again. I actually wanted to go back and see it um, before we got on this interview because you were the first, you, you said something about molluscan systems, I don't know, but you were the first to discover some sort of trace in a, in a, in a neuron. It was like a tonic spiking in some sort of molluscan species or something. It, it was, what was it, it, it was um, elliptical bursting where neurons there oscillate in and out of action potentials without having big hyperpolarized dips between them. This had been hypothesized by mathematical modelers, but it had never been documented. Um, there, there was, it had never been documented until I documented it in 1998, and nobody ever notices it, but I, anyway, I'm proud of it. <laughs> that's, no, and that's what I'm saying. It's super I exciting. know I did it. But I was, telling, <laughs> I was telling my girlfriend, I was like, look at this. I was like, look, look at what my professor did. And she had no idea what it was going on. And, uh, and I was pretty excited to be to be a student at that point. So that's very cool. Now, I only ask you about the teaching because I was talking with um, you know, another professor. And we were discussing the climate, the political climate of like the university, how it seems to be really difficult with the whole pass-fail system. Um Peggy, the provost, has been just getting a lot of hatred. Um, I didn't know, you know, what your opinions or what your experience with that was, um, because I'm curious. I haven't waded in too deeply because I, I, I work in a department that doesn't have an undergraduate major, and I, I tend to advise pre-major advising for freshmen, and most of the freshmen I've had have been eager to just work as hard as they can for letter grades. Uh, but my policy over the past year during the pandemic has been whenever a student comes to me with an issue, I'm just going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And I know you had some things happen in, in the bumpy road in the past year, and you came to me and said, I need this. I said, okay, let's figure it out. Because I, I thought the better policy would be to just flex uh, as much as possible and give the student the benefit of the doubt. So mm. I don't I don't yeah. I don't have any strong feelings about the, the provost policies. I, 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 I was mostly fighting for my doctoral program and focusing on the doctoral program and the policies there. Mm. Yeah. It's just tough so being on the student side, I mean you hear obviously I'm just exposed to so many conversations about people being upset. I don't want to call it complaining, because it's not really complaining. Um but some of it was. I can see it. You know? I can see it from the student perspective. And now I'm going to just challenge you to think about another thing. So, the, I don't like to think about college as being this world, and then there's the real world, right? It's not so distinct. There's the real world is everywhere. But when I first started at William and Mary, uh, it was 2003, and then uh, my wife and I got married as soon as, as soon as I started at the college here, and she got pregnant. And so, for my during my first year as a professor at William and Mary, pre tenure, with zero grants. Uh, and never having taught classes before. Uh, my wife was pregnant and she gave birth to a pr prematurely. My baby was in the NICU, the neonatal, inten neonatal intensive care unit, and my wife was in an intensive care unit because she had um, some medical complications. And I had a grant deadline within one week. And the National Science Foundation wasn't gonna let me delay my grant. So there was a time in my life where I was visiting my wife in one intensive care unit and then driving down to Norfolk to, to visit my son in a different kind of care unit, and then spending the rest of my day writing a grant. And like, that really sucked. But like, that was my circumstance for a certain window of time. And so I'm just suggesting that at some point in life, there's gonna be a crunch moment where everything is happening and then there may not be an escape hatch. And that does occasionally happen. It, you know, do, do you kind of see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. I think that the, the only thing that you can do is have, have good friends you can lean on, and recognize your own capacity to deal with adversity, and as Joe Plumeri says, embrace adversity. 
that's going to make you stronger. I know that sounds so trite or whatever, but I actually think it's correct to find what your own what what, what capacity you have for for hard work and and resilience. Find that level, but then make sure you have a shoulder to cry on or somebody to lean on to help you. Like for instance, what I outlined for a difficult part in my life. Well, I did have a wife and I did have a son, yeah. right? So. I was yeah, pretty happy I, uh, about those things. So that they made my life harder, but they also made it richer. I, yeah, I'm thinking to myself, it sounds it sounds really familiar. Is he like a motivational speaker or a lifter? He's he's way more than that. I mean, he's an esteemed alumnus from okay. from the college, and he's he's okay. now a huge benefactor. Like Plumeri Park is. That's okay. That's where I've seen his last. And he's okay. endowed lots of things. There's. His name is on a lot of things at the college, and for good reason. He's a really profoundly interesting person, great alum, benefactor of the faculty, um, and big supporter. And he wrote a book called The Power of Being Yourself, and it is a bit of a you know motivational type book, but it's a terrific yarn. And um, I, I actually recently reread the book because um, he also he also gives an award to faculty, a faculty excellence award. And I've been fortunate to have received it twice, including in 2020. So um, when you get that award, they give you his book. <laughs> so I've read it twice. Oh, nice. Once in 2017 oh, nice. when I got it, and then once in 2020. That's actually pretty exciting. What are they? What is the criterion? Is it just like, is it student voted upon by students? Or it's faculty? Not, it doesn't involve students per se. It, it, there's a, a committee that's put together by the provost office. And, it used to be that faculty were just nominated by someone else for it, but nowadays faculty can ask, actually ask for the prize. And then you um, write a statement saying why you think you are excellent and what you would do with the resources if you were given the award. So I recently said that I would mm. use it to study the midbrain control and initiation of locomotion, stuff that I think is applicable to Parkinsonism. That's pretty cool. Where are you trying to go? I mean, do you have an end goal ultimately? I want to... With your I mean, research? my philosophy as a neuroscientist is get to the nuts and bolts of behavior. And by nuts and bolts, I mean molecules, ion channels, and signaling, intracellular, subcellular, molecular level mechanisms of behavior. So in my work on breathing, I want to understand the nuts and bolts of breathing. Uh, I did the cellular level. We got that. We nailed it. Now we're at the level of ion channels and signaling. So that's the, the core explanation. That's what I seek. The same thing for the midbrain locomotor. Uh, work. I want to understand the ion, cha ion channel and genetic mechanisms that give rise to the ability to initiate and terminate and regulate motor programs. For me, that's the core explanation, the level of genes and molecules. Mm. Do you think, so the field of neuroscience, I think sometimes suffers from sort of it uh, an animated idea that everybody is out to figure out the problem of consciousness. And it's tough because it's like, I really try to reel it in and try to ground myself in what we know and what you seem to be studying. Do you ever find yourself wondering, you know, what is, uh, like, is all this stuff you're studying? Is this like, what, what is going to bring about our answer to like this big problem of consciousness that neuroscience is sort of predicated Perhaps. on? I read the neural, neural basis of consciousness literature. That's what Francis Crick, you know, like um, Watson and Crick, the discoverers of the structure of DNA. Francis Crick spent the last 20 years of his life studying the neural basis for consciousness. Christoph Koch, the, the, the scientific director of the Allen Brain Institute in Seattle, is studying the neural basis of consciousness. I think that, that that's an interesting branch of neuroscience. I don't necessarily think my work is going to help unlock that, but it's certainly an important part of neuroscience. I, I, I'm not too well versed in the literature of the, you know, the, the consciousness literature or whatever it may be. Um, but what can you elucidate anything that would help me understand what's going on up there? So Chris, uh, Christoph Koch in, in, in invented a concept that he called the NCC, neural correlates of consciousness. You can't prove that this neuron is involved in consciousness, but you can see that certain levels of neural activity in specific cells or ensembles of cells is correlated with conscious actions. So by monitoring ensembles of neurons in the brain, he and his colleagues were able to uh, identify NCCs, neural correlates of consciousness, and thus 
having um, having discovered that, said that this is the neural signature of a conscious decision or a conscious recognition. That to me was a major breakthrough. Mm. Yeah, I've always tried to conceptualize the idea of consciousness or even thinking or thought anything to do with the brain as simply an amalgamation of matter in a certain space that is able of conduiting energy or communicating with the matter within that space. Um, and that sort of gives rise to what we see as being, you know, thought and and locomotion. So what you're saying is not wrong, but to me it's too vague because it can't identify any specific, mm -hmm. it doesn't yet identify anything specifically. Like if you wanted to tell how, how a car operates or some machine, you would be able to point to what I say, nuts and bolts. This is, this is what this piece does, this is what that piece does. Okay, the brain is not a machine like a car is, but what the explanation I seek is like, this ion channel does this thing, we can show it. That ion channel does something different. And that's the kind of explanation I seek, not something that takes a lot of explanation, but I can point to clear experiments that show you exactly what this ion channel does. Maybe sometimes that explanation is not possible, but in some cases it is possible. I think that's important to communicate to people that are getting into the field because sometimes, again, I wish they would teach it in psychology they classes don't. as well. They don't, th they don't think about neuroscience I know. like that. And, and that's why I, I'm not going to disparage my colleagues in psychological sciences. I have a lot of great colleagues in there. But for them, the black box explanation is enough. And for me, it's totally not. It's nowhere near enough. I need the biophysical explanation. That was part of my justification for choosing neuroscience over psychology when I was considering a major change in 2018 was I didn't want to only rely on a theory that was more or less just accepted by the community um, and seemed to be self-evident. I wanted evidence that I could point to and look Nuts and, and bolts. say this is where Nuts this comes bolts. from. Lego bricks. This is why you got to build it up from the basics. Lego bricks, yes, exactly. You know, it was talking about, in James Nestor's book, it was talking about um, the flow of electrons. There was a theory, or I forget who it was by, but it was literally like um, living things attract electrons, and that is a correlate for like organisms and, and alive beings. I don't know how much you subscribe to that ideology, but... <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make any sense physically, so not too much. Yeah, I remember, I think, I actually think it was in the, it might have been in the after, or the epilogue, but. I mean, it's yeah. obvious, like, cell biology is a discipline. We know how cells work, all right? We don't know everything, but we know basically how cells work. We know what gives rise to resting membrane potentials, active membrane potentials, graded potentials, muscle contractions. You can't invent some woo-hoo theory that violates physics, I mean. So, there are a lot of mysteries out there, and I like to focus on the real mysteries, not invent you know, something crazy yeah. about elect flows of electrons through living beings. It doesn't, yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. So you enjoyed the book, though. You thought it was, oh, yeah. you thought it was a good read? Absolutely. What exactly, what did you like the most about it? I think it makes people pay attention to their breathing and recognize how powerful it is. Um, we tend to overlook breathing and its importance. And, and James Nestor's book I, I tells you to step back, think about this. There's a primordial connection between the breath and the emotional state of the brain. Just because we haven't appreciated it in our contemporary American society doesn't mean others haven't. So if you look at Eastern traditions, and the book makes a big point of this, like the practice of yoga and breathing discipline for samurai warriors, people have recognized this anecdotally and harnessed the power of breathing to affect the mental state for thousands of years. We should come back and relearn those lessons. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that's, I, that's I was, what I loved about the book. Rethink your rethink the power of breathing. Yeah. I was going to ask what you think people should, should take away from from this. And I think that's good. I also think it's, I mean, it comes out at such a killer time. What with, you know, COVID-19 being sort of such a, I don't know, obvious, an obvious uh, problem to be dealing with in the world. So I thought and it was it's a respiratory, uh, respiratory-borne illness. 
Yeah. 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 I thought it was interesting how they did the Stanford study where they blocked the, the nasal passage for 10 days and then they unblocked it and they allowed them to only breathe through their nose that you can actually get you know sinus infections from mouth breathing. That was a fascinating part of the book and I'm glad you reminded me about, about that. The, the, the importance of nasal breathing was, was profound and, and also what he said about um, malformation of the jaw and the teeth all being mm-hmm. related to oral facial use of the nostrils and I, I thought that the, those aspects of the book were fantastic to make people rethink the simplest things. Mm, I started chewing gum more, you know, and I look. I was still looking at my smile. I was like, yeah, I guess I kind of got a messed up, messed up uh, jaw as well. No, it made plenty of sense. But yeah, so now whenever I go jogging or I'm working out, um, I remember putting down the book and I said, I'm going to go for a jog and I'm only going to breathe through my nose. And I lasted maybe six minutes on the beach, and I couldn't do any more. It's really hard. Yeah, it is. It's very difficult. If you're jogging at a low intensity, you can do in through the nose and out through the mouth, but not if you start raising the intensity. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I had a surgery this past winter break that was, I mean, I had an adenoidectomy, a septoplasty and a tonsillectomy. So I kind of just got the plumbing, you know, just everything ripped out. And that was to stop uh, apnea, some sleep apnea that I was suffering from. Has it helped? And it, it did, it did, it really did. But, um, you know, I worry that it'll come back, you know, because I'm, I'm now okay with the concept of mouth breathing. You know, I, I kind of got comfortable with you know just being like oh, okay but then i read the book and it's like oh mouth breathing will lead to these you know apneas or these these chronic respiratory issues and so i sort of had to consciously step back and think to myself before i fell asleep okay breathe through your nose <laughs> it's kind of scary to think about i think chronic nasal infection is is the worry there and that happens to people that are a bit less healthy so i think if you you eat a balanced diet and stay healthy, you're unlikely to end up in that situation being chronically congested due to infection. Mm. What do you do to stay in shape? Right now, mostly I swim, and uh, I have been a big cyclist for the past decade. Um, but I've recently mm. gravitated towards I, I, swimming. I, I always see your bike. Yeah, yeah. I bike to work. I mean, that's that's easy. I do that a lot. Mm. I walk. Yeah, I... Uh... I can't do the Williamsburg heat. It doesn't work for me. No, it's pretty intense. I gotta get out of, gotta get out of yeah, here. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Have you, been, have you been here? Have you been in Williamsburg your whole life? No, eighteen years. Uh, we moved here in two thousand three to take this job. Prior to that, I was in California and Los Angeles. I've never been to the West Coast. People say it's not it's not good out there right now. Well, I've got plenty of family there in the Northern California area. I, I find it an extremely pleasant place to be. It's not the same, uh, obviously, but I do like it. Yeah. yeah, very cool. Well, I was just curious, you know. I mean, we're we're coming up on an hour, but I wanted to. I actually wanted to know more about your son's band because um, when you first sent me the Instagram tag, I looked it up, and it said that he was a psychedelic grunge band. That's that's how and they that des- was that. Yeah, that that's how they describe that's themselves: a psych psych psychedelic grunge rock band, and uh, they they formed just a few weeks before lockdown started in, in 2020. And uh, yeah. during most of the, the COVID times, they rehearsed as much as possible, um, usually twice a week. And over the past year, they wrote a lot, a lot of original songs. And then as the world started to open up again, they started playing gigs all over, all over Williamsburg, like uh, Billsburg, uh, Brass Tap in Newtown, Joe Leans on Richmond Road. And one thing has led to another uh, they ended up hooking up with a mentor in the music business, and mm. so that's that's led them to where they are now. But their their musical influences go from like the mid '60s up through the '90s. So all the way the mm. psychedelic side is from the late '60s, the Beatles and all the yeah. spinach, Eric Clapton, Cream, that really old stuff. But then they have like like their uh, Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne and good hard rock. Yeah, and then all the way up through like Smashing Pumpkins and Tame Impala of modern music as well. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I can kind of hear it. It's pretty cool. Um, I also think it's just awesome, like, you and and probably your wife, you know, this just, just handling that situation is so important because I remember when I was a kid, for instance, um, and even friends now having similar ambitions when they're young that their parents don't necessarily, you know, see as being worthwhile. Um, so I find it really amazing that you're sort of nurturing this awesome side of yourself. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Well, very good. Um, anything else from me that you want to know before we uh, we head off? Keep me posted on, on your, your podcast. And uh, it went, are you going to put it up in a feed in, app, in, in Apple or in iTunes? Or how are you going to do it? Yeah. Yeah, so I've I finally figured out how to do Spotify, Apple Podcasts. I also do the video on YouTube. Okay, that's right. Yeah, I have the so, YouTube link. Um, yeah, so I'll send you everything. You get to take a look. Um, but I, I think that was an awesome conversation. This is this is something that I've wanted to do for a very long time. It's probably two years now. And when I thought to myself, you know, who do you, what do you want to get from this, Andrew? Like, who do you want to talk to? You were one of the first people that sort of popped up in my brain. Cool, man. Well, let's keep in touch, all right? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Dr. Christopher Del Negro. Again, thank you so much for joining us for episode five of the show. I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you thought in the comments below, or you can get back to me on email at dodypandrew at gmail.com. Uh, if you want, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or uh, just let me know what you think personally. Uh, I'll get back in touch with you as soon as I can. So, sound good, everybody. Thank you so much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.